Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to have you back on Midnight Stories. So take a moment to unwind, sit back, and immerse yourself in the captivating tale that awaits. However, before we begin, I kindly ask for your support by giving us a like. It was a brisk morning. Snow still lined the side of the road, sparking under the glare of the sun. Reminds me of Edward, I thought to myself. I couldn't help but to laugh a little. What's so funny over there, my wife says. At the same time, I realized how quiet it had been. Nothing really. I'm just happy to be getting out and enjoying the fresh air. We just went back to admiring the view. We were probably right in the middle of Nevada, I would guess. I wasn't really keeping track, just watching the GPS. We haven't seen another vehicle for at least 50 miles, and however unnerving that was, it was undeniably beautiful. The highway was carved right into the middle of this big open flatland, fully surrounded by giant cascading mountains. I'm grateful that this damn snow finally melted off. I thought it would never end. I feel like I haven't hiked in years with this persistent winter. Well, honestly, I'm being dramatic and it was only about six months. It felt so long because we had been looking forward to this trip for some time before that. We were only about 10 miles away and I think we were both very ready to get out and stretch our legs. It's only been four hours cramped in here. On the right, we see a sign stating the turnoff was in about five miles. Even further off the side of the desolate road, we notice a red barn just a few miles into the desert, naturally making us curious as to why it would be out here in the middle of nowhere by itself. Not as if it mattered, but still. Before we knew it, we had finally arrived at Current Mountain. At 11,518 feet, it was no walk in the park, but that didn't discourage us. As soon as we could, we were racing to grab our supplies, snacks, and gear. Surprisingly, there wasn't any service, but we still brought our phones just in case, and we were off. I asked my wife if she remembered her camera. When do I leave without my camera, she asks, looking at me like I'm crazy. I laugh it off. Before we get too far away, my paranoia and OCD refuse to let me forget to lock the car ten times, just to assure my lizard brain that it was for sure locked. However, before I turned back around to face the beginning of the trail, I noticed something not too far off into the open desert. Is that a person? I ask, as a small bit of confusion and eeriness creeps its way in, causing a small chill to run down my spine. There were no other cars in the area, and the surrounding area isn't heavily populated by any means. There's a few small towns here and there, supported by the gas stations, casinos, and mines, but that's about it. By the time she had turned back and looked, I saw the figure duck behind some large boulders in what looked to be a forest of short pine trees. We had walked by several of these trees already, and the tallest ones couldn't have been more than eight feet, thus bringing an even more unsettling feeling when I realized this figure was hovering above the trees before it vanished. I kept this part to myself. I don't want to worry her over what's probably nothing. I don't see anyone, she says, after intently looking towards the area I pointed at. Could it have been an animal? There were all those horses a few miles back. Yeah, yeah, that's probably what it was. It must have taken off or something. I try to brush it off, telling myself I'm just seeing things. It has been a long trip and I'm running on four and a half hours of sleep due to the excitement to get out here in the first place. I wasn't very worried. I never leave without my gun, an old point three five seven, and I wasn't too bad of a shot. In order to not work myself up about some tall creep stalking us, I changed the subject and pulled out a bag of trail mix that we started snacking on without hesitation. A few hours passed by without a whole lot of conversation, just really enjoying nature and the fresh air and sounds. We finally made it to a slight ledge. We take in the view made up of an open valley and the sides of the mountain still packed with snow and glistening in the sunlight. It was truly a sight to see. We snapped a few pictures and we decided to have lunch right there. We pulled out the ham and cheese sandwiches we pre-made and some chips, but before I could take a bite I noticed something shine me in the face. I was confused. I got up and began to look around towards the direction of the light. After about five minutes of searching I found a phone. It was cracked and didn't seem to have any power, but it was relatively new. I picked it up and noticed something on the back that appeared to be dried blood. Of course I touched that right before I was about to eat, I thought to myself. I chucked the phone back down. That's a little sus, 
I say, my thoughts escaping my lips. Who knows, the path does go up higher than where the phone was, my wife stated. Someone probably lost their footing and fell and cut themselves and dropped their phone. The rational side of my brain was telling me that none of it made sense, but I couldn't come up with anything else. There were no other vehicles, so I can't imagine someone is out here stranded and hurt. I start eating my food and pick up my drink, but before I could even get a sip, the most treacherous, musty odor hits the both of us. I look up at my wife with my eyes peeled open, unable to contain my laughter. What the fuck is that? Is that you? She laughs and buries her face in her sweater, struggling to get breathable air. We both gather our stuff and hurry out of the area. As we climbed a bit higher, we were finally getting closer to fresh air and away from the cloud of must. As we were getting to about where the phone would have been below the trail below us, I stepped on an awkward shaped rock and just completely ate shit. It didn't hurt, and once again we began laughing, she held her hand out and helped me up. As I reached for her hand, I noticed that just behind her was a messy trail of sagebrush branches and disturbance in the dirt, almost like someone tumbled down the side of the mountain. I think that explains the lost bloody phone we found, I said as I stood up and dusted myself off while pointing behind her. She looked back and saw the trail of misfortune down the side of the cliff. It was nothing that would have killed or seriously hurt anyone, but definitely enough to piss you off and ruin your day, especially when you realize you lost your phone somewhere along the way. I laughed a little bit too. It's always funnier when it happens to someone else. A few hours in and we were making good progress. We weren't planning on hiking to the peak or anything crazy, but we definitely wanted to get out, explore, and see new views. Our endorphins were high and it was a good day. We were making our way up through a small area dense with shrubs, focusing on not getting our socks stuck in all the damn bushes. And then, the most horrifying, unexplainable thing happened. We both heard it. We looked at each other as if we fell into the twilight zone. What the fuck was that? She whispered lightly, face as pale as a Casper's ass. I imagined mine looked somewhat the same. There was no other way to explain it other than a massive roar, a scream almost, except not anything you could possibly imagine. It was like a man roaring, but the man had a set of lungs that could have belonged to a polar bear. Absolutely the last thing you'd want to hear in the middle of nowhere five miles from your car. We panicked. I like to think that I don't get scared, and I usually try to be rational, but my heart sank and my legs almost turned into jello. I reached into my holster and pulled out my gun. I couldn't be more happy that I put hollow tips in before I had left. I grabbed my wife, pulled her close behind me, and told her to be as quiet as possible. We crouched down, my eyes peeled, surveilling the landscape. I watch for any type of movement, but I see nothing. I whisper, get your gun now, leave the safety on, all without breaking my line of vision. We're both profusely sweating, even though it's a cool 66 degree. Still completely unsure of what that was, where it came from, and if it was even a threat, we both decide it's time to call it. I have her take her safety off and keep watch. All I can think about is the giant figure I saw just a few hours before. Racking my brain, I try to remember what I saw. Was it a coyote, a wild cow, or horse? It had reddish hair, almost ginger red. My mind was spinning. Was there even a connection between the two events? After the adrenaline subsided, I had only one subconscious thought, and that was to do everything I can to protect my wife. That was my top priority. When we decide to head back, we chose to stay off the trail just to make sure to avoid any unwanted confrontation with whatever the hell it could be. We kept low and quiet, making sure that we made as little noise as possible to not alert anything. After a good fifteen minutes stumbling through the bush and crouching to stay hidden within the small pine trees, my brain was running wild with thoughts. I hear a gasp and look back. My wife is holding both hands over her mouth, eyes watering and full of fear. I looked in the same direction she was staring, and my eyes lit up. I almost couldn't process it. I almost couldn't believe it. Just a few feet to our left was a human arm, just an arm, still with the red and gray windbreaker sleeve covering most of it. The arm looked like it belonged to a male, and it made me think about the bloody phone I found earlier. Was that just an innocent fall, or was that a part of this? 
None of that would help my current situation, and I snapped back to reality. One thing became very clear to me. This is real, and we very well may be fighting for our lives. All I could think of was quietly making it back to the car and getting the fuck out here. I gather myself. I know now the most important thing is staying strong and keeping my composure. The last thing I want is for my wife to see me panicking and scared. I stare straight ahead, plan in mind. I tell her to crouch down near the brush while I go look. As I creeped forward, my heart raced. Time felt like it stopped. With the smell of sagebrush and the breeze sweeping across my face, I almost felt euphoric while completely saturated in fear. I take a closer look at the wound, right at where the shoulder should be is just a bloody stringy mess. It was very clearly ripped off of whoever this man was. My chest began rapidly moving and I almost began to hyperventilate, my anxiety shooting through the roof. This was no game and we had to get out of here as soon as possible. As I begin to walk back to grab my wife, we both hear it again. That loud, deep, horrifying yell. The odor began to set in again. I crouched down and we covered our mouths. This time, it was much closer. My heart feels like it stops. About twenty feet away, the sounds of heavy footsteps and heavy breathing become very obvious. We freeze as we hear whatever this is sniff the air, to smell us, to find us, and probably rip us apart too. I know that I couldn't let that happen. Fortunately, it grunts in frustration and begins running in the complete opposite way of us. I don't know how it didn't smell us. Maybe the sagebrush and pine trees were helping block our scent or fear, whichever one it was seeking out. I honestly didn't care. We breathed out in relief, the odor in the air constricting our lungs. At this point, our adrenaline was keeping us from even being affected by this horrendous smell. We wait a few minutes and just take off. I finish off the last of my water bottle and put it back in my pack. I notice all the snacks and food that still lay at the bottom, untouched due to the unforeseen circumstances. We pass the sign asking everyone to stay on the trail. I remember it being about ten minutes from the parking area. I look back at my wife. We're close and I think we're in the clear. We should hurry up. To our devastation and absolute shock, we find the car completely flipped on its back and spun around, windows broken. I'm not even sure it would start if I had the ability to push it back over. I felt completely hopeless. That was our only way out. My knees turn into jello. I drop to the ground. Now we're stuck. We're fucked. I panic, looking around to make sure we're not being set up by whatever this is. I didn't want to walk down the road because we'd stick out in the open. I do my best to compose myself. I gesture to her for us to get moving and we take off, both our hands on our pistols, ready to take down anything that tries to harm us. We stayed in the miniature forest of trees, weaving between them as they grew thicker and closer together. It was more work, but I didn't mind, more coverage. I knew the freeway was only a few miles away. I imagined at that point we'd be far out of this creature's territory, and hopefully be able to reach someone on our phones if there was service. We kept going for what felt like hours, but in reality was maybe forty-five minutes, still on high alert, only stopping to gather ourselves. As we began to head towards the rough direction of where the freeway was, our hearts sank. We both dropped, covering our mouths. The smell, it was back and stronger than ever. I felt like we were standing right next to it. We look around, eyes wide open, but we don't see anything. We got up and made a run for it, but before I could get more than fifteen feet the air was knocked from my lungs. I collapsed, not even sure what just happened. I wave my hand, hoping she'll just go and keep running since I can't even breathe enough to speak. My gun is still in my left hand. I'm wheezing for air, putrid air. I'd almost rather pass out instead of having to breathe this in, but I had to keep going for her. I heard her scream and she did in fact run. I look over to where I hear commotion. There it was, towering over these seven and eight foot tall trees. He must have been nine or ten feet tall, animal skins draped over himself his hair a bright red color, his sideburns connecting to his beard, and his beard hairs connecting to his shoulder and chest hairs. I almost couldn't believe my eyes. The commotion I heard was him throwing the tree to the ground. The tree was just a small branch to him. I imagine this tree hit me right in the gut. I felt my broken ribs flex as I breathed in and out and again. 
Time felt like it just stopped, except this time I heard nothing. I noticed that I couldn't even smell anymore. The giant being brings his arm up to wipe the sweat off his brow, staring off at her as she ran, almost like it was just a thrill chasing us, like a cat playing with a mouse, killing it and then going on with its day. I look down to my hand, fist still clutching my point three five seven. I look back up. The red-headed giant was considerably closer, as he would have to pass by me to get to her. Without hesitation, I pulled my gun up level with his big dumbass head and let off four bullets. It did put it on its ass. I'm certain I got a headshot and two more in the chest. It groaned and grunted, and before I even had a chance to find out what it was going to do, I took off. Those were hollow tips. Those should have brought the giant's brain to the outside, but it was simply rolling around in agony, putting out loud, horrifying sounds. I do my best to get the fuck out of there. About three minutes pass of me running non-stop, as fast as my body would let me. I hear another roar. This one sounded distraught, in pain. I hoped that would be enough to buy us some time to get back to civilization. Within about ten minutes, I could see my wife running in the wrong direction. I'm cramping. My adrenaline is beginning to wear off and I fear I won't be able to catch up. So against my better judgment, I call her. She heard me, stopped, and looked around quickly until I entered her line of sight. She immediately began running my way. I dropped to my knee, bracing against a tree, my lungs on fire from miles of running, my cracked ribs aching with every breath. I keep my eyes peeled, however, making sure she has cover. I don't know where this creature is now. As she makes it to me, she collapses to her knees and wraps her arms around me, bawling her eyes out. I began to feel relief, comfort. We have to get out of here, and we have to keep it together right now. We're not dying here. Cover while I reload. I very quickly dug into my side pocket, rummaging around and grabbed four hollow tips, the shakiness making it very difficult to keep a grip. Before I could get the last round in, our moment of what we hoped was peace was quickly interrupted by a much louder, deeper, and angrier roar. This roar was then followed by about six, seven other roars and whooping noises. I've either gravely wounded or killed one of theirs. This was no small thing to just be looked over. No, they've just declared war against a smaller, weaker, and slower species. We had to get out of here. We book it, and I tell myself I've made it this far, so I can't give up now. We're running the roaring and whooping continuing. As we run, large boulders the size of basketballs begin landing in the areas around us and behind us. They knew our general direction. They would do anything to exact their revenge. That thought terrified me. A group of giants, angry, violent, limb-tearing giants were after us. I made it my mission to at least make sure my wife made it out alive, even if that meant sacrificing myself. I keep close behind her, keeping my hand on her pack to help make sure she keeps her footing, since she's quite clumsy and a fall is the last thing we need right now. The trees begin to become more scarce. This brought two separate feelings to my attention. One was fear, as we are now more exposed and can be easily spotted. The other was relief, because the trees are a lot less concentrated as you get closer to the freeway. We were getting more desperate, more weak, out of breath. The taunting whooping continued behind us. An absolutely terrifying fact that they were gaining on us, made obvious by their giant footsteps racing towards us, sounding like a herd of wildebeest creating a stampede. Through all that, through the running and pain, I noticed something. Something red. A structure. My will and desire to keep going skyrocketed. We could hide. We can get help. Maybe they'll have a vehicle or more guns. We'd be out of giant territory. As we neared the end of the tree line, we noticed the building we saw was the red barn we passed on the way in. It was only a few football fields away, and somehow we've managed to avoid capture by these monsters. That's when the last thing you'd want to happen did. The terrain wasn't smooth and pleasant. It was sandy, rocky, and uneven. There were random dips in the dirt making running an uneasy task, especially when you're running for your life. The last little stretch seemed like 100 miles, but to our relief we made it to the red barn, crashing through the door and collapsing to the ground. We knew we weren't safe, but we didn't have any more in us. We were dehydrated, extremely hungry, and emotionally and physically depleted. We did the best we could, and if that was it, then it is what it is. 
However, after about 10 minutes goes by, we're able to finally catch our breath. I'm going to check the window, I whisper with a shaky voice as I look over at her. Of course, I'm terrified, but I needed to know. I rolled onto my stomach and crawled towards the window facing the tree line. Thankfully, this old barn has plenty of holes in the boards that make the siding of the building. I peek through one of them so as to not be seen, even though they damn well knew where we were. What I saw made me sick to my stomach. Shocker, I know. As I looked through the little hole and my eyes adjusted to the light, I could clearly see the thinning tree line of the miniature forest. I can see six figures hovering over the trees, all red-headed, and all of them way too fucking big. Oh fuck, I said horrified. There are six, she whispers. I had no idea what to do besides start shooting. The thing that was curious to me was that they would not go past the tree line. Was that their territory? Are we in the fucking brunette giant's territory now? Is that a thing? It felt like we were being toyed with. What's my next move? I'm frozen and I watch them pace the tree line, whooping and hollering here and there. The pungent odor is still lingering. I crawl back to my wife and we just lay there holding each other. We didn't talk, we just enjoyed what we thought would probably be our last bit of time together. Next thing I know, I'm waking up to the sun shining directly in my eyes from a little hole in the side of the barn. It was cool, birds chirping. The air smelled fresh and clean, no signs of any odor. If not for the circumstances, it would have been a beautiful morning. I feel relieved. I nudged her a little to wake her up. To both our surprise, we were alive and unharmed. She smiled at me, tears in her eyes. We were so close to giving up before we reached the freeway. I stood up noticing I was able to sleep most of the pain away. A few ribs were broken, but for the most part, we just had scratches and bruises. I'll take that over my arms, being ripped apart by a giant human any day of the week. I stood there for a few moments reflecting on the prior day. Mostly the moment that time almost came to a stop, as I watched the massive humanoid fall to the ground. I guess I'm just completely in awe that this creature even exists. I could see double rows of teeth as it groaned and yelled in pain. His giant hands not only were the size of probably my entire upper body, but as he reached for the bullet wound on his head, I could clearly see he has two sets of thumbs on both hands. The regular thumb in its proper place and then the other thumb which was symmetrical to the normal thumb but on the pinky finger side. I shook my head and came back to reality. I couldn't believe this wasn't some bad dream. This stuff isn't supposed to exist. I know I used to be a nerd and into all this type of mythical stuff. Cryptids all of it. Yet here it is. What else actually exists? Skinwalkers? Santa? My thoughts were quickly interrupted by the sound of an older diesel truck. I felt panic and relief at the same time as the truck pulled up with its huge dump bed. It's coming from a dirt road about a half a mile down the tree line. It's all closed in so I assumed it was just a farmer and he's stopping by his barn. Apparently this guy gets to go in their territory no problem, but when I do it it's an issue. Anyways, it was safe. That's all that mattered. We gather our belongings and run out the door to greet the man driving the truck. It all happened so fast, but as soon as we stepped out and he stepped out, he had his shotgun on us. Don't fucking move or you both are dead, he yells out before we could even say a word. I try to explain to him the situation, but every time I try to say something, it's met with another threat. Where's the gun? He shouts frantically while looking at my pack. We mean no harm to you, sir. My gun is in my bag. I'll happily throw it to you. I just want to get home, I said shakily. This man was damn near 7.5 feet tall, his jeans and t-shirt covered in dark dried blood. The massive GMC 5500 he crawled out of looked like a Ford Ranger to a normally tall man. I toss my pack his way. He grabs it and digs through the bag while keeping his gun on us. He eventually gets his dirty old hands on my gun. He shoves it in the back of his waistband and the Virgo in me just couldn't keep my mouth shut. Did you really just put that in your ass, man? We're trying to get home or call the cops or something. We were just attacked by giant creatures. What is your fucking problem? There will be no cops, boy. Yeah, I heard about your little stroll through the woods. You sure did a number on Magnus. He'll be back on his feet in a couple of weeks, though. They're a little more durable than us. Well, I shouldn't say that. 
Then the old man pulled off his sweaty cowboy hat, and tucked in that hat was about a two and a half foot long braid of bright red hair. That was my half brother out there you decided to shoot. We, uh, we didn't appreciate that much seeing as this is our land and all, he says with his abnormally large head cocked sideways. My brain swirled with the amount of plot twists that had been going on. My patience was in the negatives and my blood just began to boil. So what then? You just expected us to not defend ourselves from a giant creature trying to kill us, rip us apart. Just simply give up? Is that what you would do? I yelled. He responded the same way any idiot would when they get caught in a question that requires an answer going against his pride and ego. Well, boy, I'll never be in that position now, will I? I'd say I'm pretty damn safe out here. You guys, not so much. See, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to shoot you. None of that. I'm simply going to hand you over to them. Unless you try to run, then I'm going to fill you with buckshot. As he laughs like a psychopath. My wife hides behind me, only showing her face to see what exactly is going on, right as he's finishing up his wheezing laugh. I felt the cold barrel of her gun against my back, causing me to wince a bit as the metal was cold against my skin. I had hope, though. I completely forgot about her gun. I don't know, I guess I thought she dropped it while running. However, this idiot seems to think he's completely safe by the way he lets his shotgun point to the ground, looking up just to be dramatic while he cackles. I knew I had one last opportunity to try to save our lives, before the inevitable demise from giants tearing our limbs off and eating us becomes reality. In a split second I reach behind me and unload the entire clip into this slow dumbass. Didn't even have the reflexes to move his gun back up. His eyes opened wide before his massive body slammed to the ground. I walked the ten feet or so until I was standing right over him. Well, you're not too durable yourself, big guy. I stare down at him as he's gasping for air, blood pumping out of his neck and chest wounds. I rolled his weak body over, tore my sleeve off, and retrieved my gun from this giant man's ass crack. I wiped it clean and put it back in my pack. Within two minutes of this whole ordeal, the whooping and hollering began. They know it wasn't his gun that went off. I'm sure they've been around him enough to know the difference in sound between a handgun and a shoddy. My wife crying and screaming for us to get in the truck and go is what brought me back to reality. I was in shock, thinking I was finally free again. But this time we had a vehicle. We raced to get in. As I was about to jump in the driver's seat, I noticed in the distance giant figures racing to us. I assumed they want to mutilate us, and worst of all, they broke the tree line, so it must be pretty serious this time. After getting in the disgusting truck, we were met with the odor. Small bones with dried pieces of meat still stuck to them littered the floorboards. Random wires were running from one side of the dash to the other. Dust made its home everywhere. However, we were in no place to complain about the transportation. We're desperately searching the cab of this truck for the keys, and of course they are nowhere to be found. And in the middle of all of that, they're hurling massive rocks at the truck, and this time they're not missing. Were they just herding us to the barn? Is this just some game? Regardless, I jump out of the truck and run to the massive man's lifeless body, dig in his pockets and find nothing. How did this asshole turn on his truck? I can't think. I know the window for our safety is quickly disappearing. I'm scared and sick to my stomach. Out of pure anger and rage, I kicked the dead body and kept kicking until my shoes were bloody. I felt like a wild animal backed into a corner, except I was taking it out on a dead guy. My mental capacity was struggling. On the last kick to the ribs, I see the faintest shine in my eyes. There it was. In his t-shirt pocket, just the tip of the key popped out. And in that time, my brief moment of insanity was completely justified. I yanked that key out of that pocket so fast and I felt as though God was watching out for us because it started right up. Not some bullshit out of a horror movie where it takes ten tries. I put the pedal down as far as it would go and just kept going. The giants are hurling rocks, but I'm able to swerve around and fuck with their aim, and to our relief, there it was, the freeway. We were free. We made it. We won. As I turn off the dirt road and smash right through the barbed wire fence to get onto the freeway, I can see four of them hovering around their dead relatives, and two that kept chasing us a little more. 
Fortunately, they knew they couldn't keep up and just stopped about a mile away from the barn. We could still hear them yelling very loudly. Anger and pain were both very apparent in their hollering. I didn't care. I didn't care about their pain, and I sure as fuck would have taken more of them out if I had the ability. But we were safe. We both began laughing and crying. She held on to me tight. We didn't even have words. We both were still very much still processing the past 30 hours now that we weren't running for our lives. As you could imagine, we called the police, and as much as we knew they wouldn't believe us, we had no choice but to tell them everything. They looked at us like we're just high, got lost in the desert, and just had a bad trip. Regardless, they had to take into consideration my car, the arm we discovered on the trail, and the dead wannabe Hagrid. I imagine his relatives took his body, but the shells should still be there as well as the blood that poured onto the ground around him. Within two days, we were informed the police had nothing to do with the investigation. We then were put in contact with a gentleman from the FBI as well as a couple agents from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We had to sign a lot of paperwork to keep our mouths shut. Really no choice in that. However, they offered to give us a settlement for that tragic day. Basically, they were paying us to keep our mouths shut, and to be completely honest, I was just fine with that. I wanted to put all of this behind me and never think about it again. Truly the most traumatizing event in my existence. I don't feel guilty about killing the guy. I was protecting my wife and myself. I now just struggle with the uncertainty of everything. Are we safe? Are there more creatures out there? I felt like I just wanted to stay home forever. A few weeks go by and we begin to settle into our normal routine. Our anxiety is calming and things seem to get better. I'm more grateful for my life, for the food I get to eat, for the things I do have. You don't realize how good you have it until you're about to lose it all. I just wanted to be thankful and grateful for my wife. We both talked about it and decided to put it behind us and move on and live the life we deserve. We relax a little after our discussion, have dinner and go to bed. I put my head to rest on my pillow and my mind can't help but wonder. From my old nerd point of view, I was completely amazed by the giants. This whole time they've just survived out there. In the freezing, the overbearing heat, basically living like it's still the 1400s. Were they humans at one point? A gene pool that just broke off? The thought of this stuff made my heart race and I began to sweat a little. I got up and cracked the window for the cool air. As soon as I opened that window, any drowsiness I once had was ripped away. There it was again, so strong. I'm no hero. That much will become obvious as you read my account. In fact, I'm a coward. The type who always takes the easiest path. Left to my own devices, I would never reach my full potential. In all honesty, I'm an average guy with a dull life. But the story I'm going to tell you almost defies belief. I don't know why this happened to me. Was I chosen, or is it all random? My enigmatic guide and benefactor offered me few answers. I often wonder why I walked out the other side when so many others remain trapped in that hellscape for all eternity. It's safe to say I suffer from survivor's guilt. Perhaps a medical professional could help me work through these negative thoughts. But how would I explain my horrific experiences within the supernatural realm? So in desperation I will share my story here in the hope of finding some empathy or understanding from those with an open mind. My story begins like so many others you've heard. I was down on my luck, unemployed, and behind on my rent. In my desperation I trawled through the help-wanted pages, finding little which didn't require experience or qualifications that I do not possess. My attention was drawn to an obscure ad in our local paper. You know the type. No details or company name, only a postal address and the offer of a suspiciously large remuneration for completing an unspecified job. I know what you're thinking, and you'd be right. I should have known it was too good to be true. The red flags were so fucking obvious, and deep down I did realize it was a risk, but I was in a bad place and at my wit's end. The address in the advert was located in a rundown part of town, and my internet searches brought up no results. I figured I'd go down there, and if it seemed fishy, I'd get the hell out. No harm done. How fucking dumb was I? My bus journey was non-eventful. 
as was the half-hour walk I made across the dilapidated business park full of derelict office blocks and empty cul-de-sacs. I'll confess that my anxiety levels rose as I approached my apparent location, double-checking the address to make sure I had the right place. The building looked closer to an abandoned fortress than an office block, built from gray concrete in the brutalist style. I glanced upwards in awe to discover that the building didn't have a single visible window. I'd never seen anything like it, a structure so bleak and unimaginative, but at the same time oddly foreboding. There was no company signage or any indication of what was located there, other than a small entrance with darkened windows and a faded street number hanging above it. This was it, the address from the ad. I felt a cold chill run through me as I gazed upon that darkened doorway. Looking back, I know I should have turned around and walked away, but I'll admit to being intrigued. More than that, I was drawn in, perhaps by a power beyond my comprehension, a black magic capable of overcoming my primal fears. I walked forward slowly, pushing through the tinted swing doors and entering. What I discovered inside was an unremarkable reception area, poorly lit with chip-tiled floors, worn-out furniture, and an appointments desk hidden behind frosted glass. After all the anticipation, this underwhelming little room was something of a disappointment. Still, I was here now, and so thought I might as well see it through. The reception area was abandoned, and so I approached the desk, gently tapping on the frosted glass in the hope of gaining somebody's attention. A tense pause followed, and for a moment I thought the desk was unattended, but then I heard a low sigh emanating from the other side of the glass, and a moment later the shutter opened to reveal the person inside. The woman who glared out at me looked like a parody from a 50s sitcom. She was an elderly woman with blue rinse hair, big framed glasses, and a scowl on her face that could turn milk. To say she wasn't happy to see me would be a gross understatement. Yes, she spat at me, without even a trace of politeness. I was slightly taken aback by the frosty reception, and so it took me a moment to formulate a reply. Eh, I'm here about the ad in the paper. It said there's a position available. The receptionist sighed loudly and rolled her eyes before turning back to her computer terminal and aggressively typing into her keyboard. Name, she demanded without looking up from the screen. John Smith, I replied nervously. Now, just for clarity's sake, my name isn't really John Smith, but I don't wish to reveal my true identity on this forum, and so this rather unimaginative alias will have to do. Her demeanor seemed to change somewhat after hearing my name. I wouldn't say she brightened to me but she did at least look up from her monitor and meet my eye. Ah, yes, Mr. Smith. My manager is expecting you. Now I was really confused and more than slightly concerned. Who was her boss, and how the hell could he or she be expecting me? I hadn't phoned ahead or emailed for an appointment because neither was an option. I'd simply turned up at the location unsolicited, so there's no way they could have known I was coming. I said as much to the receptionist and she reacted with annoyance. Are you saying I don't know my job? I'm telling you there's an appointment on the books. Now if you don't mind, my manager is waiting for you. And it would not be wise to keep him waiting. She pointed to the red door at the back of the reception area, a door which somehow I'd completely missed on my way in. I stared in disbelief at the doorway, feeling very uneasy, before I turned back to the aged receptionist only to be met by a stone-cold glare as she continued to point. Well, she exclaimed impatiently. I didn't realize at the time, but this was probably my last opportunity to walk away. I suppose I rationalized it in my head in that moment. Sure, this was a weird and unsettling situation, but perhaps it was all just a misunderstanding. The receptionist was old and cranky. Probably she just made a mistake, thinking there was an appointment when there wasn't one, and I must have missed the red door on the way in because I wasn't paying attention to my surroundings. Sure, I'd come this far, so why not pass through this mysterious red door and discover the truth? What harm could it do? As it turned out, I was entering a world of pain. The handle was ice cold when I reached out to turn it, slowly opening the heavy door. But when I walked inside, I was hit by a wave of intense heat. Still, the temperature was the least of my concerns as I surveyed the room discovering a space very different to the rundown and sterile reception area. Instead of worn-out armchairs and scratched coffee tables, 
I found an extravagant study which wouldn't have looked out of place in a 19th century country manor. A soft red carpet lay beneath my feet, while before me sat a huge, solid oak desk covered with bizarre ornaments and oddities. Furthermore, the walls were adorned with shelves of leather-bound books, classical-style artwork, and what appeared to be hunting trophies, with the severed heads of various wild beasts mounted in a rather macabre display. I continued to explore the ample room, soon discovering the roaring open fire in the far corner, from which the intense heat was emanating. As spectacular and awe-inspiring as the room appeared, there was also something oddly unsettling about it. Within a few seconds I began to feel paranoid, like I was being watched, and when I looked to the portraits and trophies on the walls, I could almost sense their dark eyes upon me, as if they were somehow alive and filled with a malicious intent. I realized then that this may not be a safe place, and so reckoned I should probably leave. Slowly I started to back out of the room, but then suddenly the door slammed shut behind me, making me jump. Jesus, I swore as I turned my head. I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, but you will not find your savior here. I jumped once again higher this time whilst I simultaneously yelped aloud in shock, turning back towards the desk in time to see an enigmatic figure appear from the shadows. This turned out to be the man, if indeed he is a man, who would shape and control my terrifying experiences over the coming hours and days, changing my life forever. The boss, whose name I would never find out, is an unremarkable man to see at first glance. He appeared as a slight elderly man in his seventies or eighties, with thinning hair, wrinkled skin, and a striking but comical white goatee beard. He was well dressed in a finely tailored dress suit, complete with waistcoat and bow tie. When he spoke, his voice was soft, but his words carried a sinister undertone, especially given the bizarre circumstances. There was nothing overtly threatening about his appearance, but nevertheless I felt uneasy in his presence, as the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. Mr. Smith, I assume, he asked. Eh, yeah, that's right, I replied nervously, still wondering how he knew my name. It's a pleasure to meet you. Please take a seat. I glanced back at the shut door before reluctantly walking forward and taking a seat facing the solid oak desk. My mysterious host removed a crystal decanter and two glasses from a cupboard, pouring brown liquor before offering me a glass. Drink? I probably shouldn't, I replied. Please, I insist. You may find that you require some liquid courage for the challenges to come. I didn't like the sound of this, although suddenly I did want that drink, and so I reached out for the glass and raised it to my lips, pouring the strong alcohol down my throat. Now then, Mr. Smith, you've come in response to our advertisement, of course. Yes, I confirmed cautiously. I understand there's a job going. The man shook his head in the negative. A job? No, sir. I'm afraid there has been a misunderstanding. I have a dedicated team in place, and regrettably there are no permanent positions available. What I do have, however, is an exciting opportunity for a motivated young man such as yourself, a unique challenge which will yield a substantial cash prize upon its completion. By this point I was annoyed, but also intrigued. I'd come all this way for what seemed like a load of bullshit, but if there was even a chance of getting paid, I needed to hear him out. Hmm. What do you mean by challenge? He paused for a moment, looking thoughtful before he gave his answer. Well, sir, we have a facility here on site. An interesting little space that we call the Labyrinth. The game is simple. You go in, and if you successfully negotiate the maze, you receive your prize. Oh, you mean like an escape room? I interjected. The man looked puzzled, frowning before he replied. Yes, it's something like an escape room. His explanation was far from convincing, and I was now sure this was total BS. I didn't know whether this cash prize was genuine or not, but I decided it wasn't worth the hassle. Thanks for the offer, sir, but I think I'm going to pass. He was clearly not happy at my refusal. Although his smile didn't falter, I could see the simmering anger behind his eyes. I'm afraid it's already too late to turn back, Mr. Smith. He snorted. Now it was my turn to get angry. Who the hell did this guy think he was? I felt like giving him both barrels, but instead I simply stood up and raised my hands defensively. Look, man, I don't know what this is, but I'm leaving. Thanks for the drink. I stood up and started walking away, still feeling his hard stare on the back of my head as I marched towards the door. 
but when I reached the exit, I found the door was still shut and there was no handle on the inside. I pushed against it with my shoulder but had no luck. It was at this point that I began to panic. When I turned around, I was shocked to discover the old man standing directly behind me, his eyes upon me and his expression cold and emotionless. You need to let me out of here, I exclaimed. He didn't answer. Then I placed my shaking hand into my pocket to withdraw my cell phone. Do you want me to call the cops? I cried. Those things won't work in here, he answered coolly. I looked at the screen and saw he was right. I had no signal. Shit, I swore. Suddenly I saw red as I reached out and roughly grabbed the man by his jacket. Listen, old timer, I don't know what game you're playing, but you need to let me out right now or I'll kick your ass. What happened next is still something of a blur in my memory. In an instant, the man before me was no longer frail and elderly. Instead, he transformed into something monstrous, a towering figure who stood over me, his eyes intense and filled with a murderous rage. With impossible strength, he tossed me across the room like I was nothing but a rag doll. My body crashed down on the hard floor, the pain shooting through me. I tried to stand, but my attacker was on me in an instant, pinning me down like a predator would do to its prey, his eyes red with hatred and his teeth exposed as he spat out words of pure malice. Listen to me, you little shit, he screamed, his face only inches from my own. This is my fucking house, and you'll follow my fucking rules. You made a choice in coming here today and now you want to back out? Not a fucking chance. You've run away from every challenge in your life, but no longer. You'll enter the labyrinth and face your demons, otherwise I'll rip you to shreds with my fucking bare hands. Do you understand me, Mr. Smith? I gulped, looking into his predatory eyes and knowing he was serious. My whole body shook and I struggled to speak through my quaking lips. Okay, I spluttered. My attacker smiled as he climbed off me, instantly releasing me from his icy grip and returning to his harmless old man persona, even offering his hand to help me back to my feet. Well, Mr. Smith, I'm glad all that unpleasantness is behind us. Now shall we proceed? He pointed towards a jet-black door at the back of the room, a door I was certain hadn't been there a moment before. I dreaded to think what horrors lay behind it, but I knew I had no choice but to go forwards. I just hoped there would be a chance for escape or to seek help. My legs were still shaking as I followed my captor towards the ominous doorway, watching carefully as he opened it and motioned for me to enter. I didn't know what to expect once I passed through that black door, but knew it wouldn't be good. I was however confused to find myself led through a mundane office space, with rows of workers sitting in cubicles and diligently typing away at computers. My dedicated administrative team, the boss explained. We had some issues with discipline in the past, but thankfully we've all moved on. It was only then that I looked upon the workers as they collectively raised their heads to greet me. To my horror, I saw the pain and fear in their eyes and realized that their mouths were sewn shut, preventing them from crying out. Instead, they silently pleaded with me for help, but I was in such a state of shock that I could do nothing except swear lower my head and walk on. I couldn't imagine the horrors these poor people must have suffered and feared that the same fate awaited me. But soon we left that hellish room and the tortured souls trapped inside it as my captor led me to yet another doorway. This one engraved with bizarre runic symbols and constructed from an ivory-like material that I feared could be human bone. My captor placed his hand upon the door handle pausing as he turned to face me and offer some last words of advice. This is it, Mr. Smith. You're on your own from this point onwards. You'll find that the labyrinth is an unusual and dangerous place, unlike anywhere you've visited before. Time passes differently on the other side, and many of the physical rules of our world do not apply. You'll have no need for your normal bodily functions, to eat and to sleep, for example. The whole experience will seem like a particularly vivid dream, but do not fall into complacency, Mr. Smith. The dangers you face on the other side are very real, as are any injuries or pain you may suffer. My final advice to you is this. Do not trust what you see, and remember that you're on your own. Good luck, Mr. Smith. I hope to see you again. His words were more sympathetic than I'd expected, although I certainly didn't like what I was hearing. I decided to make one last plea for my life. Please don't make me do this. 
The man's smile faltered ever so slightly, and he lowered his head, as if in shame. I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, but there is no other way. Remember what I told you, and you might have a sporting chance. I thought about running, but it all happened so quickly. In an instant, the door was open, and my captor shoved me through, shutting it firmly behind me. In a panic, I turned back to the door, only to find it was no longer there. Instead, I was faced by a solid concrete wall. I slammed my fists against it, screaming until my knuckles were bloody and my lungs hurt. Defeated and exhausted, I fell to the floor and accepted my fate. I'd entered the labyrinth, and there was only one way out. Before I continue my tale of woe, it's worth trying to explain what exactly the labyrinth is, or at least to describe its characteristics. The labyrinth is not a maze of hedgerows or a medieval-style dungeon. Instead, it takes the form of a modern hellscape, an endless maze of empty office rooms, ugly yellow walls, damp carpets and buzzing fluorescent lights, all connected by dimly lit corridors and annexes of impossible length. I have no idea how big the labyrinth is, although it's clearly far larger than should be physically possible. And the boss was right. The rules of physics do not apply inside, and it's impossible to measure time, not least because watches and electronic devices do not work there. The tedious and soulless design of the maze is at first unsettling, but in time the surroundings will drive you insane. But that's nothing compared to the hideous creatures and terrifying beings that occupy the back rooms. The horrors which stalk the corridors and will use all methods at their disposal to draw you in or hunt you down. And that's what the labyrinth is, an endless tedium broken up by periods of intense terror, all leading to a gradual loss of hope. My first steps through the labyrinth were daunting and depressing. I tried hard not to succumb to panic and despair after I'd recovered from my initial shock and the tantrum I threw when I tried to break through the wall. I also tried to think logically, imagining that there must be an end to the hellish network of identical offices and corridors. And so, I walked for hours, perhaps even days, until I was physically and emotionally exhausted. My feet ached and my retinas burned due to the constant glare of the lighting. There was literally no end to it nor was there any discernible pattern or logical layout. Every room, every annex and corridor were identical to the last, and I had no means of marking my path, with no breadcrumbs to drop. The labyrinth has a way of disorienting you, and so it's nearly impossible to tell whether you've been in a room before or not. For all I knew, I could have been walking in circles all that time, only to arrive back in that first room. And the boss was right. Normal rules don't apply inside the labyrinth. There's no way to keep track of time, and my normal physical needs did not apply. I didn't eat, drink, shit, piss, or sleep the whole time I was in there. Not sleeping was the worst part. I got so tired but had no respite. I could still feel pain, however. Sores on my feet from the walking, bruises on my fists from banging on walls, and an endless throbbing migraine caused by the glaring lights and constant electric buzzing. Those first hours and days were hellish and draining, but this was nothing compared to what came next. At first I assumed I was on my own inside of the labyrinth, and that was a hell in itself, the isolation and the loneliness, but that was before I encountered the monsters who call the labyrinth home. It would be some time before I saw anything or had any definitive proof of their existence. What I heard were disembodied voices from far distant rooms and unexplained scratching noises from behind the walls. These sounds were unsettling and often frightening, but I could never tell whether they were genuine or not. I began to think I was going insane, and these bizarre sounds were the product of my demented mind. But unfortunately, that turned out to be wishful thinking. I remember the incident where I first met her. I'd been walking aimlessly for what seemed like hours until I finally collapsed against a wall in exhaustion. I can't say whether it was morning or night, and frankly I didn't care. In that bleak moment, I seriously considered ending my life, but I couldn't think of any practical method of committing suicide and doubted whether it would stick in this twisted realm. Even so, I'd reached rock bottom and didn't think I could go on. But the thing about the labyrinth is this. It will always find a new way of fucking with you. And right then something happened which was completely unprecedented. I recall hearing a cracking sound from the ceiling above me, and so I looked up in time to see the fluorescent strip lights flicker and then go out completely. 
plunging the corridor into total darkness. What the fuck? I swore in frustration as the fear pulsated through me. Now this was darkness unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. So dark that I couldn't see my own hand when I waved it in front of my face. There was no light anywhere, and as far as I knew, the power was down throughout the entire labyrinth. I hoped the outage would only be temporary, but after waiting for what seemed like an eternity, I realized the lights weren't coming back on. I was wondering what the hell I would do next when the situation escalated. Suddenly the banging started, a constant drumming on the walls, louder than any of the phantom noises I'd previously heard. I jumped up, now in a state of complete panic. Without the benefit of sight, I tried to focus on the awful din to determine where the noise was coming from, but the banging was all around, drowning me in a terrifying symphony of chaos. And then I heard the screaming, a banshee's wail that echoed through the corridors, soon filling the small, darkened room where I cowered. I felt a cold chill and struggled to breathe, desperately feeling the wall as I tried to escape in the pitch black. But suddenly it wasn't dark anymore, not entirely at least. I looked ahead and was horrified to see a pair of blood-red orbs emerging from the darkness, demonic eyes staring right at me. And then another pair appeared, and another, until I found myself the target of two dozen crimson eyes, all filled with malice and a murderous intent. I could not see the creatures behind those eyes but felt sure they were pure evil and meant to do me harm. The screaming started over again so loud and piercing that I needed to cover my ears in a vain attempt to drown it out. Those hellish eyes were focused upon me and coming closer. Realizing I was in mortal danger, I panicked and started to run, sprinting in the dark even though I had nowhere to go. The beast or beasts pursuing me cried in unison, tearing down the corridor. I could smell its foul stench and feel its breath on the back of my neck. And then I hit a brick wall, literally. The pain shot through my body as I fell heavily to the floor, losing consciousness as the screaming continued to ring in my ears. By all rights I shouldn't have woken up, but I did do so some indeterminable time later, and once again the labyrinth had a surprise in store for me. When I came to, my head was still throbbing, but I soon realized the screaming had stopped and the lights were back on. The unidentified monster was nowhere to be seen, but I wasn't alone. The girl looking down upon me had soft, compassionate eyes and a kind smile. Her hair was long and dark, her skin the color of milk, and she wore tight blue jeans and a stylish leather jacket. I think I was attracted to her immediately, although perhaps my feelings were due to the tense situation. It had been some time since I last saw another human being, and after all I'd been through this young lady seemed like my guardian angel. Hey there, how are you feeling? she asked softly. Um, okay, I think, I replied groggily. My head still hurts. How long was I out? Not long, she replied. The labyrinth doesn't let you rest for any length of time. My name's Mary, by the way. Hi, Mary, I'm John, I responded, still not really understanding what was going on. How did you get here, I inquired. Mary shrugged her shoulders. The same way you did, I guess. The vague job advert, the creepy guy in the suit offering a big cash prize if you find your way out. Sound familiar? Yeah, I confirmed. I'm sorry, I didn't realize there was anyone else in here. There are a few of us about, although this place is so big you could wander around forever without seeing another living soul. It was pure chance I found you when I did. I nodded my head, suddenly remembering the terror I'd experienced only moments before. There was something chasing me in the dark, a creature with so many eyes. Mary's mood darkened. I saw the fear in her eyes as she muttered her reply. It's gone for now, but the beast will be back. Once it gets your scent, it won't stop hunting you. My heart sank as a new fear overtook me, and a sense of hopelessness hit me hard. My lips trembled as I asked my next question. So, what the fuck do we do? She scoffed before replying. We keep on moving, that's what. Keep on running the maze and never lose hope that we can escape. Her bravery was impressive, but I remained skeptical. Do you really think there's a way out? I asked meekly. I saw the spark of defiance in Mary's eyes as she spoke. I know there is, and I'll do whatever it takes. I couldn't argue with this, and so I went with her. I don't know how long we walked together through those seemingly endless corridors and carpeted rooms, 
but it seemed like an eternity. We grew close during that time, or so I thought. I did feel a connection to Mary, and I trusted her, thinking of the young woman as my savior. There was nothing romantic about our brief relationship, and I don't think anything physical is even possible inside the labyrinth. But her companionship gave me strength at a point when I was ready to give up. She didn't speak much during our time together. I pressed her, asking questions in the hope of finding out more about her background, but Mary would always evade and deflect. In the end, though, the advice Mary gave me about the labyrinth would save my life. Never trust anything you see or hear, she'd explained. In here, nothing is as it seems. A wall isn't a wall, and a door isn't a door. The labyrinth knows how to fuck with your head. It will give you hope, only to take it away again, keeping you in an endless cycle of suffering and despair. If you want to survive, you'll need to betray your most firmly held beliefs. You'll do things you never thought yourself capable of. And even if you do make it out, you'll likely carry the guilt with you for the rest of your life. I didn't get it at the time, but she was totally correct. I don't remember much about the moments before the attack. Perhaps I should have realized Mary was acting strangely, but I couldn't have predicted what she would do. We were walking down yet another endless corridor of strip lights and damp carpets when suddenly all hell broke loose. I froze to the spot when I heard the banging, soft and distant at first, but soon growing louder and closer. And then came the flickering of the lights, followed by the hellish banshee wail. Jesus, I swore. I turned back to Mary, who now stood some distance behind me. It's coming. What the fuck should we do? Mary didn't meet my gaze as she continued to back away, retreating from the coming threat. The lights won't go out this time. She whispered carefully. It likes to show its true form before consuming its prey. What? I exclaimed in a panic. What the fuck do you mean? We need to get the hell out of here. Mary shook her head and I saw tears forming in her eyes. I'm sorry, John, I really am. But there's no other way. I told you I'll do whatever it takes to survive. And with that she turned and ran. I stood there gobsmacked. It took my panicked brain a moment to comprehend what had just happened. She'd led me into a trap, sacrificing me to the beast so she could survive. Horrified, I turned back towards the corridor and saw the monster for the first time. How can I describe the horror of what I witnessed? The beast's form seemed impossible. It was not one creature, but instead a mind-boggling and hideous combination of human limbs, bodies, and faces. At least a dozen faces and two dozen eyes, all filled with pain and anger while their mouths worked in unison to produce the terrible high-pitched scream which drowned out every other sound. Somehow this monster had absorbed its victims, combining their worst features and impulses to create an abomination I could never have imagined. I remained frozen to the spot as I watched the monstrosity advance clumsily but surely down the narrow corridor, its many hungry eyes focused upon me. I turned and ran, exerting every ounce of strength in my body while the beast chased after me, Mary was quick, but not fast enough as it turned out, because I soon caught up with her. What happened next will haunt me for the rest of my days. Acting on a primal instinct, I grabbed her roughly by the shoulders, ignoring her screams, and I used all my strength to physical throw her backwards, straight into the path of the charging monster. I glanced back only momentarily, long enough to see Mary on the floor, reaching out and pleading for help before the beast devoured her. And like a coward, I ran and kept running until the screams faded, and I considered myself safe. It took some time for me to recover from the attack and come to terms with what I'd done. But of course I was still trapped inside the labyrinth and still in mortal danger. I remembered what Mary had told me. I'll do whatever it takes to survive. Boy, was she telling the truth. But that wasn't the only thing she'd said to me. Remember, nothing is as it seems in the labyrinth. A door isn't a door. A wall isn't a wall. I considered this cryptic advice. It made no sense in the real world, but real world rules did not apply here. What the hell, I thought. So I walked into the next identical office room, put my face against the wall, closed my eyes and let my body fall. By rights I should have banged my head against the bricks, but instead I kept falling until my face hit soft carpet. Astonished. I lifted my head and found myself back where it had all started. The comfortable study adorned with oak furniture and heated by a blazing open fire. 
and above me stood the enigmatic boss in his tailored suit, his thin smile now transformed into a wide grin. He genuinely looked very happy to see me as he held out his hand to help me to my feet. Well done, Mr. Smith, you made it. I never doubted you. I accepted his hand with suspicion, wondering if this wasn't just another mind fuck. I don't know what you did, but somehow you've beaten the labyrinth. An impressive feat indeed. I experienced a wave of immense relief as I dared to believe this might actually be real. You mean, I can go? I asked meekly. Of course you can. He answered amicably. I am a man of my word after all. Oh, I almost forgot. With that, he walked back to his desk and pulled out a briefcase. There's still the matter of your compensation. He popped open the case to reveal stacks of crisp green bills. I trust 100,000 US dollars will suffice? I looked at the money in astonishment, not knowing what to say. I didn't feel like I deserved this reward, and a part of me wanted to tell this twisted old bastard to go fuck himself, but I was weak. Okay, thanks, I mumbled, taking the briefcase while avoiding eye contact. The old man insisted on shaking my hand nevertheless, continuing to smile as he led me to the door. Congratulations again, Mr. Smith, and good luck. And so that's it, my story, for what it's worth. The money allowed me to pay off my debts and achieve some degree of financial security, but the horrors I experienced in the labyrinth continue to haunt my nightmares. And I don't think I'll ever recover from what I suffered inside that hellish maze. I still carry the guilt with me, knowing that I sacrificed Mary's life to save my own skin. But it's her words that stick with me. To survive, you'll do things you never thought yourself capable of, and you'll carry it with you for the rest of your life. Once again, she was right. I'm glad to be out and really do have a new appreciation for life. But what I did to survive has changed me, and the nightmares of that beast will never end, because now Mary is a part of its monstrous form doomed to crash around the labyrinth for all eternity.